welcome. You are listening to Zeal Fear House. I am your host, David Murray, and I'm joined with Dorothy Carruthers. Our focus here is on our relationship with our Heavenly Dad and all aspects of His Kingdom, moving in greater intimacy with Him. Additional teachings, books, and articles may be found on my website at www.dwmurray.com. That's dwmurry.com. Again, thanks for joining us, and let's get rolling with this week's broadcast. Well, good evening. Uh, welcome to Blog Talk Radio. This is David Murray. I'm joined with Dorothy Carruthers. Dorothy, how are you tonight? I am doing well. A little hot, but other than that, just fine. <laughs> yeah, it's sticky over here uh, in uh, New York, Connecticut, Jersey area. For those of you that are in other areas, we're going through a, a little bit of humidity over the weekend. But uh, i got a fan blowing on me now, and we're focused, and hopefully we'll... We'll get through this, Dorothy. You don't have an AC over there, do you? I don't have any what? An AC. Do you work off of fans? I use mostly fans. I I have fans, but I also have an air conditioner because the uh, humidity really brings up the um, asthma. But yeah, my air yeah conditioner I remember you telling me is, that. Is, yeah, my air conditioner is trying to die. It's old. So... We have the ACs too, I'm not, but I'm always trying to use a fan whenever possible. But I I know that the humidity gets to you with that. Um, so hopefully, hopefully uh, it's not too bad this evening where you're sitting. But um, I am looking forward to this night's uh, teaching. You and I have been talking about this for a little bit. Um, that we're finally able to bring it forward. It's knowing both the lion and the lamb, and. Um, I'm excited. The reason why uh, I'm excited about this teaching in particular is we're going to begin peeling apart some of the ways in which we communicate and commune with God and the way we relate to him. In this hour, guys, we we hear a lot of things, and I know I kind of speak on this uh, a little bit, but it's one of my places in the body of Christ is, is to point us to the throne room. One of the things that we hear a lot about in this hour, we don't, in the body of Christ, we don't get a ton of teaching these days. Uh, there is not a, a really, there is a wealth of people speaking of things to come, um, talking about uh, the judgments to come. There is not a lot of talk of what we're to do with that information. There's not a lot of talk of how we are meant to take that teaching and develop greater intimacy with the Lord whether it's to walk with him in greater holiness and, and greater joy and, and a greater intimacy, and through that reflect his nature more to fulfill the Great Commission, there's not a lot of solid teaching. There's a, there's a lot of proclamation, but the body really hasn't been getting fed as much as the Lord would like to see us, according to Scripture, be fed. Ephesians 4.11, use all the different gifts and members of the body of Christ, the elders, the callings and the functions, to bring us into the full statue of Jesus Christ. It is my goal, and one of the things that I know that I'm commissioned to do as one member in the body of Christ, and we all have a voice and we all have a place, is to teach and instruct us how to get to greater intimacy with the Lord. One of the ways that that is is by understanding the author of the one who wrote the Bible. We're going to talk about three basic aspects. Um, Jesus as the lion, Jesus as the lamb, and then application and intimacy. The introduction here is going to be that, that is understanding where we're at. The times when we're at there, the body of Christ typically knows the Lord is either one camp or one understanding of the other. The lion, they know Jesus as the lion, or believe they understand him as the lion, or they know or believe they understand aspects of him as the lamb. We are called to know both the lion and the lamb. Uh, in the same way that we have friendships, that we have relationships, we have marriages, if we, to the degree that we only know an aspect or a certain part of our friends, is we develop uh, intimacy, social or relational intimacy, to in the areas that we know that person in. The more areas we know that person, the greater that we can commune with them on deeper levels of our heart, as is appropriate. 
And these are one of the areas that we're struggling with in our communion with the Lord. The real danger in this hour is not the limitation in our understanding who he is. You know, we grow from glory to glory. We understand him as the day star rises within our hearts. We get greater revelation of him, Paul says. The danger, guys, in this generation and the danger in a lot of the teaching that's going forth in this hour, if you want to call it that, or proclamations in this hour, no matter what it is, no matter what camp it's from, is that we tend, we're choosing to approach Jesus based upon our own hurts and woundings. The tr- I'm talking about the true church now. Much of us are hiding behind our theology in order to hide ourselves from our own hurts and pains. And the way we choose to hide behind our hurts and pains, we, you, we pick whether we want to hide behind who we want him to be as the lion, the lion or in our hurts and pains and woundings, who we want him to be as the, the, the lamb, the lion or the lamb. Proverbs 23 says, as a man thinks within himself, so he is. Uh, So I want to peel back a little bit. This is not going to be exhaustive. I'm going to be camping out a little bit in Revelation. I know many of you are thinking, oh, David, Revelation, yes. Uh, Rule rule number, I'm going to say rule number four, Bible interpretation, in no particular order. One of the main rules in Bible Bible interpretation is you always interpret the obscure in light of the obvious. A violation of biblical interpretation of biblical study is that you interpret the obvious in light of the obscure. What does that mean? It means we don't take a passage that's very clearly written, openly written, that is not written prophetically or cryptically, and we attempt a very open, very plain passage about the nature of God. We do not take that and change it based upon an obscure passage of Scripture. We do not take revelation and make other verses twist into what we believe the mystery, much of the mystery of revelation is saying. Uh, we don't do that. The, all of Scripture must fit into the nature of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ's earth ministry was very plain. There was nothing cryptic in his nature. And Jesus stated, and Peter and Paul stated, that Jesus was the exact representation of the Father. So if we were to just take that biblical principle and use some common sense, much of the um, confusion and um, silliness in this generation, would, 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 uh, we wouldn't fall into the snares of that. We uh, interpret the obscure and what the Lord could possibly be saying in, in the obscure in light of the plainly revealed nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible is progressive revelation. The Lord gave us his nature. That's why he spent three and a half years on his earth walk ministering to people and giving them the nature of the Father revealed to them. Uh, So when we discuss anything, it's based upon the nature of Jesus Christ, who is the exact representation of the Father. So from there, let's read. We're going to read Revelation 5. We're going to go with 1 through 9. This is John who was taken up into heaven. John was translocated uh, or translated. He was taken spiritually into the spirit plane and was a witness of things to come, that he was to write down the things that had taken place and things that were yet to take place. So he was having uh, heavenly experiences. Some of his experiences are courtroom experiences. Some of them are war room experiences. He is explaining different things that are going on as Jesus is revealing to him. And they, some of them are deliberately made cryptic. That's deliberate. The Lord, you know, was, was not ignorant of the fact that some of these things would not be plainly known to us. We will continue to get information as God reveals this information in this hour. But number one, if we ever are curious or want to say, well, you know, what should I be focusing on? Number one is intimacy. We're called to intimacy. Anything that we're doing or studying, any theology that we are embracing, if it is not pointing us to understand the nature of Jesus Christ and through that the perfect exact representation and nature of our Heavenly Father, if we are not learned to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit who speaks forth the will of the Father, and the nature of the will of the Father is the same as the Lord Jesus Christ during his earth ministry, if we are not growing in that understanding, growing in his nature of his good and love, his goodness and love, uh, we need to examine the motives of why we are choosing to spend so much time 
studying certain topics or discussing certain things. It's indicative of uh, areas of our heart that may be out of alignment with what is on his heart. Let's read Revelation 5.1. And I saw, this is John speaking now, recording. I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or, or to look at it. Verse 4. So I wept much because there was no one found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and loose its seven seals. And I looked and behold, in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. So that's the father. Jesus took the scroll from the father. Verse eight. And when he had taken the scroll, the living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every uh, tribe tongue and people and nation here's one thing uh, church that I want to impress upon you that I know is not discussed much if you look at this text verse 4 talks about behold the line of the tribe of Judah has prevailed verse 6 It says, there stood a lamb as though it was slain, having seven horns and seven eyes. He came and took out of the right hand of the father the scroll. It was the, it was not, guys, the lion, the all reigning and roaring God who took the scroll with the seals. It was the lamb. That if we get nothing else out of the book of Revelation, is enough for us to ponder. In this one text, this one encounter that John was witness to, Jesus revealed himself as both the lion and the lamb. It was the lamb that opened the scrolls. It was the lamb that they bowed down and worshipped. Here's a question to ask. Why would the Lord show his slain appearance before all of heaven? John wrote there was one who had the appearance as though a lamb, as though having been slain. Jesus manifested himself in the appearance of the slain lamb. Here's what I want you guys to to chew on and to digest and turn around. Family, it is the lamb. The lamb is the culmination of the great redemptive plan. It was for his good pleasure that the father sent the son to die for his children. It is the lamb that is the fulfillment of the father's heart. We're going to look at three scriptures. We quote John 3.16 a lot, but um, like with a lot of things, we have our pet scriptures, but context, guys, is so important. We all know John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son. So whoever believes in him shall not perish and have eternal life. Here's verse 17, John 3, 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. The father did not send Jesus so that when the fulfillment of this picture in Revelation takes place, the lamb can condemn the world. The lamb was sent to redeem the world. That was the will of the father. That is vital to understand, guys. Jesus did not come to the earth. Jesus is manifested in this portion of Scripture here in Revelation with John as witness, the Lamb. It was the Lamb that came down to the earth to redeem the world. It was the Father's desire to win back all of us. We were all bound for hell. The will of the Father was to save the world through the Lamb. Okay, next, John 6, 38. 
For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but to do the will of him that sent me. This is Jesus showing his submission to the will of his dad, which was to redeem the world. Philippians 2.13, For it is God which works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God works in the church so that we have the desire to want to do and to actually carry out his good pleasure. Now, if we look at John 6.38 and John 3.17, amongst the entire New Testament, entire Gospels, the purpose of God's, the intention of God's good pleasure is is restored relationship. He sent the Lamb to restore relationship and intimacy. That is the will of his good pleasure, guys. An outflow of that is that we will share this good news, the good news that the Lamb was sent to the earth to reconcile all of God's lost children back to us. There is not a lot of that talk on the hearts of people in the church. We do not embrace him much as the Lamb. We are really, many of us, not interested in the Lamb that opened the seals. It was not the roaring lion that opened the seals, guys. It was the lamb that opened up the seals. Here's some locating questions for us. How do you think he sees you? How do you think your heavenly father or Jesus, what are his thoughts toward you right now? How does he see you? If you're uh, not listening to this live, you have the benefit of stopping this and meditating on this as long as you feel you need until you get an honest answer. Now, if you have a sense of that answer in your heart right now, here's how we can find out if we're hiding from our own hurts and pains. We can ask ourselves this next locating question. This will determine how accurately, how honestly we answered the previous question of how do we think he sees us. And that answer, how closely it aligns with his heart. Here's the next question, guys. How does this belief that you have reflect on how you feel toward others? Who are others? Well, Jesus, Jesus made that very clear, right, when he was asked, who is my neighbor? Jesus said, love your neighbor. He goes on to describe the story of the Samaritan, the most hated nearby neighbors of the Jews. It was the Samaritan, the person whose doctrines were perverse. The Samaritan was a mix of Judaism and Assyrianism, was a mix of all the pagan cultures in the land. The Samaritans were despised by the devout Jews because the Samaritans, when they were relocated back after the captivity, after the northern kingdom was conquered, Samaria became a mix and the Jews mingled pagan bloodlines. So to the Jewish people of the south, the northern city, the northern area, region of Samaria was considered an abomination to them. And that's why Jesus chose the parable of the good Samaritan to show the love of the neighbor. So how do we feel toward our quote-unquote neighbors, strangers, family, those who have wounded you, <clears throat> the body of Christ living in sin? Guys, how do we feel not about sin? Okay, we need to make this distinction and stop hiding behind it. I'm not talking about sin. Okay, I, I'm not big on sin. Father's not big on it. Holy Spirit isn't. Jesus isn't. They don't really give me a lot of slack with that in my life, in my thoughts. Remember, before we sin in our actions, guys, we've long before sinned in our thought life. I'm not talking about thoughts of lust. That's a cop-out. I'm talking about belief systems, who you believe the Father is, who you believe yourself is as a child of God. If our belief systems run contrary to the Word of God, we're living in sin if we never commit any sins of the quote-unquote flesh that the church likes to pick and choose which are the hot topics. It's called hypocrisy, guys. And the Pharisees are recorded for our example for the church of what hypocrisy is. It's our belief system. I'm not talking about how do we feel toward the sin that Christians are in bondage to or that the lost is in bondage to. I'm talking about how do we see those that are in bondage to sin? The backslidden Christians, the carnal-minded or carnal-living Christians, the lost that the lamb was sent to redeem. I mean, he died while we were sinners. How do we see those sinners? 
See, what a lot of talk that we have going on this hour is that we're just looking forward to the bowls and wrath being hurled to the earth. We have no clue what's on the Father's heart. We throw out scriptures left and right. We, we have rejected who the Lamb is because our own self-righteousness and our own hurts and pains want us to embrace a perverted and darkened form of who we believe the lion is that's coming. Don't get all into that. I know it's a tough word, guys. I say it in love. It's the truth of God that sets us free. I'm not saying this. I'm sharing the word. It's not my opinions. Wisdom is known right by her actions, the scriptures say. Not my opinions. That's what we see. Out of the heart, the man speaks. How many of the times have we seen this talk of the judgments or what's to come? And there's the mention of the Father's heart, John 3:17, that he did not send his son to condemn the world. Okay, let's keep going. Final locating question. How do we feel about the coming judgments to those who have rejected him and will be going to hell? And one more, one more question we'll throw in another one. Let's throw in another one. How often do we take comfort in the coming judgments? Again, not to judge sin, but to judge his lost children or even who we believe claim to be his reconciled children. How much comfort are we coming and gnashing our teeth, looking forward to the judgments so that God can judge not sin, but people? Because in John 3.17, it said he did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Guys, he didn't need to send the Son. Well, we need to just stop and, and really exercise some Holy Spirit common sense. God was under no obligation to redeem us. When was the last time we stopped and we really embraced that? When we say, well, I'm unworthy, I'm a sinner. Eh, that's another cop-out, gang. If we really say, I'm unworthy, I'm a sinner, then why did Jesus die for you? Because he loved you while he hated the sin. He was never soft on sin, guys. He's not soft on it now. But the lamb died for his children to be redeemed. It is the lion coming back to judge sin. The lamb did not come to, to condemn his children. He came to save them from the coming judgment that the lion will come back to judge sin once and for all. We need to begin seeing him as both the lion and the lamb and separating his, his lost children from what he's going to judge, which is sin. I'm going to clean it up a little bit more. So let's, let's go on to embracing. Well, the, man, the lamb, guys, manifests his love through demonstrations of tenderness. Righteousness is the culmination of his heart. The cross is the manifestation of his desire to have intimacy with us. It's love manifested in the ultimate sacrifice of the Father through his Son. It gave us righteousness. That's the culmination. That's the manifestation of the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for us. Embracing the Lamb, his unconditional love toward us, allows us to embrace him in boldness as the one who can set us free to reign with him. He will reign as the Lion. We can only partner with him and embrace his mind and know how to hear his voice and his leading to the degree that we have embraced him as the lamb. We can never purely embrace him as the lion until we first understood the great redemptive plan, that it is the lamb that was slain. It was the lamb that was sent to the earth. It is the lamb that opens the seals. His aspect of the lion. This manifests, guys, as the one who judges all things contrary to his nature. See, God didn't have to send continuous bulls one after another after another after another that Revelation describes. And, he, and he's not sadistic. His nature is that he is love and that he's good. The Bible says that. Okay, that's not me saying it. The Bible says that God is love and God is good. Everything flows from those two things, his goodness and his love. Everything flows from that. So if we have a sense of uh, and are embracing the lion as someone who's going to be hurling the bowls of judgment down because he is just so fed up with mankind, we don't have a clue, guys. The scriptures tell us that's not the desire of his heart. The scriptures tell us that. 
Okay. Um, let's begin to separate things. The word judge, guys, in Greek, it, it involves – part of the definition involves an act of separation. The lion sets us free from our sins and bondages. The lamb clothed us in righteousness, gave us the Holy Spirit now because now the Holy Spirit can partner with us because we're made holy. We've been clothed in righteousness and given a garment of salvation. Now it is the lion who judges sin to set us free. The purpose of being set free from sin, guys, is because it propels us into greater intimacy. He died for his good. We, Jesus died for the Father's good pleasure, which is intimacy. The lion judges to set us free from the bondage of sin. Okay. Romans 2, 4, or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to, lead you to repentance? The context here, guys, is not judging one another according to self-righteousness and hypocrisy. If you read this, this chapter, the context Paul is talking about is he's dealing with self-righteousness and hypocrisy. And he's saying, don't judge one another according to your self-righteousness. Don't you understand it's the goodness of God manifested in the world that leads man to repent and be reconciled to God? All manifestations of his hand in our lives, guys, are designed to set us free. That's the principle of this verse. Remember, God is love and God is good. Everything he does are different manifestations of the same goodness and love. Judgments are goodness and love, guys. Wrath on sin is love toward his children. Wrath on sin, wrath toward sin, judgment upon sin in the lives of, of, of the world is an opportunity to set us free to see and partake of his goodness. See, the scriptures say that Jesus, or he, Satan is already condemned. The Holy Spirit already bears witness, the scriptures say. There's not a second condemnation of the world. The world has been set free from condemnation through the free gift of salvation. We just have to choose to receive it before the coming judgments when it's too late. The Father's heart is reconciliation. The heart of the lion is to judge sin, to separate holiness from perversion, in order to set the child of God free to walk in greater intimacy. 1 Corinthians 3.14, if what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. What's that talking about? Everything is going to be burned up that is not of God. Why? Because God's nature is holy and pure, and we enter into intimacy with him to the degree that we walk in that holiness and purity. Proverbs thirteen twenty four. The one who spares his rod hates his child, but the one who loves his child is diligent in disciplining in him. Hebrews twelve six. Because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. What are we talking about? All manifestations of the lion, guys, are meant to separate us from sin because sin brings death. If I am committed to sin in an area of my relationship, the, uh, let's use marriage because this is a great example. The, the man or the woman that commits adultery is sinning against, is sowing death into the intimacy of the relationship. It violates emotional, spiritual, relational, um, and physical intimacy. Emotional, spiritual, relational, and physical intimacy, it brings death into all four areas of a relationship. A relationship can be defined as how, how healthy, how much is it flowing God's nature physically, emotionally, spiritually, and relationally. Right? So when we sow to death, when we partake of sin, we sow death into whatever area that, that affects. The Father loves us too much for that. That's why he chastens us. That chastening never stops, guys. But we suddenly think one day God just snaps. He just goes, he goes psycho. And we, he's just looking. Finally, the, the, the lion is, un, is getting ready to be unleashed to take out his anger on everyone. That's not what the scriptures say. It's just, it's just, we're already, already bound for hell. 
we, we, we are not no more bound for hell than the first time we sinned. You can't be more bound for hell than you were while you're, you're, you're not going to heaven. Until you've received Christ as Savior, you're bound for hell. You can't be more bound for hell, guys. Again, common sense principles. God isn't more angry with the world than he was when he sent his son and says in John 3, 16 and 17, sent his son, doesn't wish that any should perish, came to, to send the world to redeem the son, not con- to condemn it. So we really need to, to repent of some of our theology and put it up against the nature of Jesus Christ and what the whole redemptive plan is about. Let me clarify something. The Lord will utterly judge and destroy sin one day. He judges sin, not the person. Let me explain what that means. Guys, the person who has not accepted righteousness has not been separated from sin. When sin is judged, that person falls under the judgment and condemnation that sin will receive. All sin must be burned up. He sent the Son not to condemn the world. So when the judgments come and the person hasn't received the goodness of God, the good news that the church is supposed to be proclaiming now, when those judgments come, the desire of the Father's heart not to condemn the world but to redeem him don't come to pass. That does not bring him in joy. He will, shed, he will wipe away every shed tear one day, guys. And the most and the last will be his. Because the full heart of his desire that the world not be condemned, not all will receive his will and his goodness. Sin will one day be judged and all the elements will burn up and melt away and be rolled up like a rug. And the person who has not received the gift of righteousness will be caught up in the maelstrom of that sin that's being judged. That is coming, guys. We like to quote the watchman on the tower, right? We love to quote the watchman. A lot of us fancy ourselves as a watchman. It says of the watchman, he who does not warn and the judgment comes, that blood is on the hands of the watchman. So we talk about the judgments coming. And we say, well, we're fulfilling our duty. No, we're not. The scriptures do not say in the new covenant to go forth, the commission is to discuss the judgments to come. That is a doctrine for the church, guys. That is a church doctrine, not a lost doctrine. The great commission is to proclaim the good news. If the church is not proclaiming the good news to the lost, to our literal neighbors down the street, that person's blood is on your hands. And I don't say that lightly. I know that feeling. (laughs) I've had times when the Lord's got me up in the middle of the night and says, David, I want you to go across the street and go knock on the door and I want you to witness them. I said, no way. They'll think I'm crazy. They're going to call the cops on me. And the person dies that night. That's on my hands. The Lord will hold me accountable to that. Things like that have happened to me more than twice. So what I speak, guys, I don't speak idly. I speak in love and compassion. I really do. There's, there's, there's an urgency in my voice. There's a sharpness in my voice. Not toward the church, not toward the lost, toward the deception that the church is under. I have an absolute hatred in this hour toward the false doctrines that are being brought forth to the twisted deceptions that the demons are weaving around the church. I love my brothers and sisters, and I love my lost. But I have an absolute hatred to all things that separate us from the nature of God. And so does the Lord. If we are not spending time getting to know the Lord, commission is not on our heart, we are backslidden telling about the judgments to come and saying, repent, repent. We don't, we really, we don't really know what we're talking about a lot of times, guys. Revelations 2, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's talking to the church, knocking on the door of our hearts. Judgments set us free, guys. The lion reigns in order to destroy the power of sin and remove it from the lives of his creation. That's the nature of the lion. 
how do we see him as the lion? Do we see him as the one who loves us so much he's willing to discipline us? That's who we just read. That he loves us so much he'll do whatever it takes to keep us from the destruction of sin in our daily walk or our relationship. That he loves us so much he will send bowls of wrath to progressively shake up those that will open their eyes and repent and turn to him. Do we see him that way? For many, we hide behind the theology. We say, if, if we're not seeing all things to come through the eyes of his goodness and love, we're out of alignment with his heart, guys. If we want to know him as the lion and the lamb, as truly understand his nature, they don't conflict, guys. The lion and the lamb are not a contradiction of his goodness and love. They are both manifestations of what the scriptures say his nature is. The Lamb gave us righteousness. The Lamb redeemed us to the Father. The Lamb was the doorway. It is the Lamb in his goodness and love that opens the seals. And when Jesus, as the Lion of the tribe of Judah, begins to judge sin, and there's the judgments, excuse me, to come. There are several judgments to come. We talk about that sometime. There's the judgment of the church. There's the judgment of the lost. There's the judgment of the demons. Uh, there are several judgments. Judgments are meant to separate that which is of his nature and that which is of not. The lamb died to clothe us in his nature, fill us with his spirit, so that then the lion can begin to separate the sin from our belief systems, break away the lies, judge us and discipline and chase enough to us in his love so that we can experience greater intimacy. And then the outflow of that is to do what Jesus said to do. Fulfill the Great Commission. Talk about his redemptive plan, that Jesus died. When Peter talked about, we'll close this, when Peter, when Peter stood before a couple thousand people, right, those thousand men, he didn't talk about the judgments to come. He talked about what Jesus did and how they killed him. And they accepted Christ. The church does not want to talk about the salvation message because we are hard-hearted and cold, which is a fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy toward the end-time church. In those days, the love of many will grow cold. The only people that have love are the church. The love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts, the scriptures say. Only the church has the God kind of love. Four different Greek words for love. Only the church is described as having the love that is of the nature and origin of the throne room of the Father. Jesus said it was that love that will grow cold. We are there. So if we're talking about the judgments to come, World War III, famine, nation being judged. We need to ask the Lord to pierce our hearts that we begin to love the way he loves because the love of the church has grown cold. We don't understand him as the lion and the lamb. We don't even know what they mean. Guys, it's, it's okay. There's no condemnation in this. When he corrects us and his word pierces our hearts, it's to bring us to repentance. It's an aspect of his goodness that gets us to accept the invitation to turn toward him in spirit and in truth and worship him, commune with him, Walk with him in the cool of the day and walk with him at the night time, the night watch. We have twisted and perverted every doctrine, every aspect that is not rooted and grounded in his love and goodness. Anyway, summary here. I'm going to end with 2 Peter 3, 8 through 10. But beloved... Do not be ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. I'm going to skip to verse 10 because we love to quote this. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works therein shall be burned up. Judgment is coming on sin, guys. Right? We love to quote 2 Peter 3.10. But we don't like to quote the verse that comes before it because we're not interested in it because it doesn't minister to our wounds and hurts. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, 
but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Why did Peter say that? He's saying that because judgments are coming. 2,000 years ago, Peter said, judgments are coming. And the Lord is not slack of those judgments. He loves us and doesn't desire any should perish. The church is not preaching that message. The church needs to repent. There will be different judgments to come, guys, and the church will be judged based upon our accountability and our faithfulness to how we walked on this earth. We'll still receive a righteous reward for what we did. That's what they're talking about. Anything that's not built upon gold and silver and precious metal will be burnt up. It doesn't mean going to hell. But in that day when we stand before his throne room with a million times a million millions, all we'll stand with him and receive is what we did according to his heart. Everything else will be burned up long after this earth has been burned up. Father is calling us to enter into his heart in all of our thinking, guys. We need to embrace who he truly is. We need to embrace what the lion truly is. We need to embrace what the lamb truly is and repent in areas where we have picked up things that allow us to foster and perpetuate our own hurt. It's not hard to see. You can hear and see when people are speaking with such anger and wrath and there's no gospel message. The heart of Jesus is removed and we use it to foster our own unforgiveness and woundings that other people's hurt us with. It's just time to grow up into full stature. It's time to grow up into his image, guys. That's all. I love you guys. I pray for the church more than more than I ever be seen. That's so anyway. <clears throat> It's food for thought. Um, I know that's a challenging word in this hour. Believe me, I know that. But praise God, I would not be a faithful watchman if I did not share what's on the Father's heart. So, Dorothy, anyone have any questions that are in the queue? No. Okay. Well, praise God. I know that's a a lot to take in. There's a lot to, to listen to. And it's a challenging word, but it's not my word. It is the word of God in context. So praise God. He loves us and he's faithful. Guys, there's no condemnation in areas where we're outside of it. He loved us when we hated him. He loves us now in the areas that we don't walk according to him. He wants to come. And in this hour, guys, I said this a year and a half ago, over two years ago now, And we're continuing in that season. The Lord is refining the church. He's extending invitations. He's causing pressure to be exerted on our lives individually to break us free from the things that we've held on to that prevent us from moving in true intimacy with him. The the heat is going to continue to be turned up during a period of grace in this current administration. Um, And we'll talk more about that in the fall a little bit of what's going to continue to unfold. A lot of the things that I've shared about some of them have already begun coming to pass. We're going to continue to see them coming to pass. The Lord will do things his way, not ours. The Lord is not limited to our checklist of how things will be done. Uh, and we'll talk more about that another time. So anyway, Dorothy, God bless you as always. I'll give you a buzz when we're off the air and uh, we'll catch up. And to my beloved family, know that you're loved. I love you guys more than words could ever say. And uh, just know that above all things, all that matters is he died for you. And that love that he died and sent his son for never slackened, never changed. Dare to seek out and find out what that really means, guys. Love you all. Talk to you soon. And hopefully uh, we'll see you guys uh, either this coming week or the following week. Dorothy, God bless. I'll talk to you soon. Father bless, David. Good night. Good night. Fear House. I'm David Murray and I'm joined with Dorothy Carruthers. We were hope that you were blessed by this week's broadcast. Again, if this was your first time, please stop by my website at www.dwmurray.com. That's dwmurry.com for additional teachings and insights. God bless you and until next time, please dare to accept the fact that your heavenly dad loves you deep. Thank you.